Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of uh, CWS Wildlife Chronicles. Um, center for Wildlife Studies is an internationally recognized center for excellence in the areas of wildlife research, conservation policy, and education. And since 2020, we've been doing a lot of webinars, and uh, we've covered a lot of interesting topics from human wildlife interactions and environmental education to primates, snakes, tigers, elephants, etc. You can watch all of our previous webinars on our YouTube channel. And if you need to reach out to us, you can reach us at outreach at cwsindia.org. Um, my name is Vinnie Jen, and I'm a research fellow at Center for Wildlife Studies. And I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, David Quammen. Uh, David is an author and journalist who has written more than 15 books, and he's written hundreds of articles for National Geographic, Outside Magazine, The New Yorker, and more. He writes about nature, science, biology, travel, and his books include The Song of the Dodo, The Tangled Tree, Spillover, and his most recent book, uh, which is about the coronavirus pandemic, uh, titled Breathless, The Scientific Race to Defeat a Deadly Virus. He's been awarded an Academy Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and he's also a three-time recipient of the National Magazine Award. So welcome, David, and we're really excited to have Thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you. It's very good to talk with you and to be here with CWS. So I, I'll jump right in and uh, I'll ask my first question for you, which mm -hmm. is you started off um, with a degree in literature and you started off writing fiction. So what led you to nonfiction and topics like nature, ecology, biology, etc.? Well, I was always interested in both in the natural world and in writing. I mean, since I was a kid, since I was 11 or 12 years old, I had those two interests. The natural world, I spent a lot of time in the woods and forest near my home when I was growing up, uh, but I was also interested in writing. And in school and in university, I had great literature teachers, great English teachers, and good biology teachers. And, um, and probably for that reason, among others, I went toward the literature interest and started my writing career as a fiction writer. I published my first novel when I was when I was young, just out of college. Actually, it was 52 years ago, which feels strange to me to to say that I published my first book, and that was a novel. Published a few novels, and but then I I discovered I rediscovered my interest in the natural world once I started uh, reading more widely in nonfiction. And I also found that uh, it was very hard to make a living as a as a fiction writer, as a novelist, even if you were fortunate enough to have published your first book very young. So I drifted into nonfiction because that was what I was reading. That was what I found interesting. I was reading history of science, history generally. I was reading biographies of Darwin. I was starting to teach myself just by reading started writing more ambitious long nonfiction books about initially ecology evolutionary biology and conservation and that's where i've been ever since and even writing about viruses my more recent work on viruses spillover in 2012 and this new book breathless i began doing that when i realized that, that the stories of emerging viruses new viruses that infect humans and cause outbreaks and sometimes pandemics it's all ecology and evolutionary biology. It just happens to be the ecology and evolutionary biology of dangerous viruses. That's uh, that's a pretty crazy journey. Um, and this it is a crazy journey. journey. It has been, <laughs> yes. And and that brings me to my next question, which is, I mean, now that you've transitioned to nonfiction writing, a lot of what you do is you're condensing a lot of complicated scientific information and making it easy to understand and making it like gripping and easy to read. So do you find that challenging and you know, how do you do it? Well, it is challenging, uh, uh, but it's, it's what I feel comfortable doing. I think part of what I do uh, is aided by the fact that I have no formal training in science myself or very little academic education in science. And I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a literature person. I'm an English major who has journeyed into science on my own reading, 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 and, and it has become a, a journalistic beat for me over the last 40 years. And the fact that I'm an outsider to science, I'm an amateur, I know that I'm not a scientist, helps me, I think, in explaining science 
to the general reader because I can remember so clearly what it feels like to be an outsider, to be new to these ideas, these facts, these theories. And so I try and write about those things in a conversational voice aware with every paragraph, every sentence I write of the reader who is trying to pick these things up um, and, uh, and being attentive to the needs and the wants of the reader, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, thinking, does the reader um, need a change of pace now? Does the reader need for me to shift subjects? Does the reader need a joke? Does the reader need a human story? And I try and provide that. I try and sense what an individual reader might be feeling. Is this person now getting a little tired of my explanation of recombination among coronaviruses during the replication process? Uh, maybe it's time for a joke, or maybe it's time for tell it, inserting a human story. And that's another important part of it. I, I never forget that science is a human process. So when you write about science, you write about people. You tell human stories, the human stories of the doing of science as a process and not a body of facts. So keeping all those things in mind, I, I, I feel like I can be um, the average reader's proxy, the average reader's advocate wading into these complicated things and coming back out with a sensible, understandable version of it that involves human story. I think... Uh... Anyone who does science communication can learn from that. I think that's a really good tip. <laughs> um, and how much research does it take you to write one of your books? Well, I do a lot of research. I, I read a lot of journal articles and books, but I have piles and piles of journal articles on my desk always and files. Uh, and then I contact scientists and ordinarily I contact scientists and ask them if I can go into the field with them and see their work over their shoulder. You know, when I did my book about um, about big predators, Monster of God, that began, uh, it really began in India. It began when I contacted um, now my good friend Ravi Chellam of the Metastring Foundation, formerly of the Wildlife Institute of India, when he was a graduate student doing his PhD on the Asiatic lion at Gear. And I asked him if I could come to India and, and see the Asiatic lion and his work on it over his shoulder. So that's what I do. With uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, I couldn't do that because I couldn't travel. None of us could travel. Uh, so I researched that book in a very different way. I researched it by Zoom, just the way we're talking now. Uh, but I still researched it by going to the scientists, doing the work and asking them to speak with me about their work, about their views of this virus, and about their lives during the pandemic. And so that book, this new book, Breathless, is, uh, is about the, the origins and evolution of this virus, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. But it's a, it's a, it's a narrative of, of work by people, human scientists, uh, on this journey to understand this virus better. Wow. So, I mean, I guess COVID basically changed the entire way you did your research. It did. The pandemic did completely change the way I did my research. Um, when I was, I, w I was working on another book at the end of 2019 and early 2020, I was working on a book about cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. Uh, and I had gone to Tasmania, the southern state of Australia, to spend time in the field with biologists who were studying the Tasmanian devil, that little uh, marsupial scavenger, omnivore, because the Tasmanian devil is desperately affected with a genuinely contagious, transmissible form of cancer, a facial tumor that is passed from devil to be devil when they bite one another in the face. So they're dying of this, this bizarre, supposedly impossible, contagious tumor. Well, that has a lot to say about cancer as an evolutionary process. So I was down there with them and then the, the pandemic got started. And when I came back from that trip, my publisher, Simon & Schuster said to me, why we want a pandemic book we want a book about COVID-19 this pandemic that's just happening 
and we think you might be the one to write it for us. So why don't you push that cancer book to the back of your desk for now, and we'll give you a nice new contract, and you can do a, a book about the pandemic for us. And so I said yes, not because it felt like an opportunity, but because it felt like a duty. But I realized that I had two problems to solve. One, there were going to be a lot of books about the pandemic. Clearly, every publisher probably was going to want a book about COVID-19 of some form. And generally, I have preferred to write books about things that other people are not writing books about. Island biogeography, big predators and and indigenous people on, on, on precious landscapes. Um, horizontal gene transfer, molecular phylogenetics in the tree of life, those kinds of things. And, and awakening readers to something that was very far from anything they had thought about. But this, this was gonna be something that other, a lot of other people were writing about. So I had two problems. One, how do I research this book when I can't travel? I can't get on a plane to Wuhan tomorrow and, and, and go to Southern China and climb into caves because nobody can get into China right now. And I'm writing about something that a lot of other people are going to be writing about. So I spent much of 2020 mulling that over and doing some magazine work on the pandemic, I wrote some pieces for the New Yorker about it. Um, and then at the end of the year, I, I came up with a concept of how I could do it at the end of 2020, the very end. And I realized I'll do it by focusing on the virus itself as my central character, writing about the origin and evolution of this virus, SARS-CoV-2 is the formal name of the virus, and its fierce journey through the human population and the scientists who study it, the people who, the molecular evolutionary virologists and the epidemiologists and others who study this virus and have been helping us understand it. And I would do that by Zoom. So I started emailing scientists around the world saying, could I interview you by Zoom, an extended interview for about an hour and a half? And I'd like to ask you about your work on the virus and your professional view of the virus, but also about, about your life, your own life during the pandemic, your life as a, as a lab leader, your le life as a teacher, uh, as, as, a, as a parent, uh, in, as a as a son or a daughter of perhaps of elderly parents, your own life. And so I did that and, and did 95 of those interviews with leading scientists around the world uh, and finished, you know, from, from Tony Fauci in the U.S. and George Gao, who was director general of the China CDC um, and other scientists that people know from the media to... Uh, unknown but brilliant graduate students in different universities who are doing important work on the coronavirus. And, uh, and then I got all those interviews transcribed and that was part of my material. And I had all the journal papers from those scientists that I'd read. And, and then it, that took me the first half of 2020 and then the second half of 2020, I got up early each morning and wrote hard and, and wrote the book and delivered it right at the end of 2021, which was my my deadline for my publisher, just a little less than a year ago. And and then there was a lot of fact checking and revising and more fact checking and more fact checking and correcting to do. And now the book is out. Uh, um, as someone who does research, it's so fascinating to hear about like the entire process that goes behind writing a book like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm excited to talk to you more about this book. But right now, um, you know, let's talk about your one of your earlier mm -hmm. books. So um, can you tell us briefly about Song of the Dodo and, you know, how you came up with that idea and, um, you know, all of the travel and research that you did for that? Yes. Yeah. The Song of the Dodo was important for me because it was the first major nonfiction book that I wrote. And um, I began oh, back in about 1988. Uh, just before that, I got interested in the subject of extinctions on islands. I learned that the birds of Guam, a little island um, in the Pacific, it had a number of, um, of endemic species, full, full endemic species unique to that island, Guam, and they had started going extinct. Uh, and the reason they were going extinct is that 
a species of New Guinea tree snake had been accidentally introduced to Guam, probably on by the United States Air Force well, on, on, on planes that had been flying between the Solomon Islands and New Guinea and back to Guam, which is a U.S. air base at the end of World War II and just after. And so the snake had gotten in there. And the snake did what exotic species, invasive species do in lots of places. It, it went wild. It had, it had an opportunity suddenly to feed on a lot of naive prey and it had no real competitors or predators upon it. So it exploded and these endemic species of birds started disappearing. So I wrote a magazine piece about that. And I, in the course of researching, I said, I wonder if there's any any substantial literature on the subject of extinction on islands. And it was, as I, as I looked into that, it was like breaking into a great cavern, just poking your way through you know, a little gap in a wall and coming out into this great cavern filled with stalactites and stalagmites and, and maybe cave paintings, ancient cave paintings, 40,000 years old. And I just discovered the literature of evolution and extinction on islands. And at the same time, I had gotten interested in a, in a 19th century British naturalist named Alfred Russell Wallace, who was famous but not famous enough for having co-discovered the idea of evolution by natural selection at the same time, but independently of Darwin. And he was a very sympathetic character to me. And so I just for, I thought for a while, I should write a biography of Alfred Russell Wallace and tell his story. And then I thought, no, I should maybe try and write a book about this subject of of evolution and extinction on islands. And it has implications for conservation on the mainlands because as the mainlands are broken up into fragments and as we settle um, landscape with our own constructions and we reduce natural habitat to these isolated national parks, they function as islands too. And these, these rules of extinction jeopardy on islands apply to all of our creatures that we're trying to preserve in national parks, in these enclaves, these insular protected areas. So I thought maybe I should write a book about that. And then I realized this could be one book because Alfred Russell Wallace learned what he learned about the evolution of biological diversity by studying islands, by spending eight years in the Malay archipelago. So I put those ideas together and then I spent eight years doing that book. I spent about five years traveling the world and researching it, going to the, the Malay archipelago, which is now Indonesia, going to New Guinea, going to uh, Tasmania, going to islands and fragmented habitats in many parts of the world, spending time with scientists, looking over their shoulders, having adventures and misadventures many of which went into the book. And then I eventually wrote the book. Um, so it was an eight year project overall. And it's a book about um, evolution and extinction on islands and what the study of islands has taught us about evolution and extinction on the mainlands in the age of fragmented habitats and, and beleaguered national parks and jeopardized biological diversity all over the planet. Uh, yeah, I think that was the first book of yours that I read, and it really got me interested in island biogeography. Oh, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And a few years after this, you wrote a book, um, Monster of God, which is about mm -hmm. people and their relationship with predators like lions and crocodiles and, you know. Um, so what got you interested in this topic? And, you know, what's so special about those relationships? Well, it was the Asiatic lion that got me interested in it. I came to India. I went to Gear with Ravi Chellam, spent time there, wrote a magazine piece about the Asiatic lion. And um, and I loved everything about that experience. Um, I met the Maldari people who live in Gear. Um, Ravi uh, was very good friends with um, one man in particular um, who had, had sort of befriended him when he was doing his his PhD work on the Asiatic lion. And so we stayed with that man, a wonderful man named Bapu was his nickname. He was a Maldari elder. 
um, and we we stayed and slept in his little compound and uh, at least part of the time and we saw the asiatic lion not just through the eyes of ravi as a wildlife biologist but also through the eyes of the local people the maldari people the the, the buffalo herders who live in the forest of gear along with the the lion um grazing not not in the actual sanctuary part the park part of gear but in the surrounding area um grazing their their buffalo in dry forest that is occupied by lions and it gave me an appreciation of the fact that you know we all have a great anyone who's interested in wildlife has a great appreciation of the big predators the great dangerous top of the food chain beasts that I came to call alpha predators. That was just a term that I invented uh, for this group of this category of of beasts that are are big enough and fierce enough and solitary enough such that a single individual of those species can and occasionally does kill and eat a human. So, you know, what used to be called man eaters. Of course, they aren't man eaters. They're creatures just trying to make their living on the landscape. And when their natural prey are replaced by livestock, they have to eat something. So they tend to prey on livestock. And that brings them into conflict with people who 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 run livestock, who pasture livestock. Um, and some of those people are are struggling people working very close to the soil, very close to the forest. And and I wanted to tell all those stories. So I focused on four cases, the um, the lion, the Asiatic lion at Gear, um, the, uh, the Siberian tiger in the Russian Far East, the saltwater crocodile in Northern Australia, and the brown bear in Romania, in the Carpathian Mountains of Romania. And in each of those cases, I wrote about the animal itself, about the scientific work, field scientists and others who were studying the animal, and the, the the indigenous people who were sharing habitat with that animal, sometimes to their danger, sometimes to their to their loss of livestock on which they depended to make a living. Um, and I told those those tangled stories in that book. So it's, it's called Monster of God, uh, the man-eating predator in the jungles of history and the mind. That's uh, super interesting. Um, and yeah, I think we can, I mean, after that, you shifted to zoonotic diseases and, you know, viruses and all of that. And I think your first book about zoonotic diseases was Spillover. So, you know, how did that transition happen? And also, what is Spillover about? Um, Spillover is subtitled Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic. And it's about the category of what are called zoonotic diseases, zoonoses, meaning animal infections, non-human animal infections that are transmissible to humans and become human diseases. How I got interested in this was by way of Ebola, that in some ways most notorious of, of terrifying, highly virulent, lethal um, viruses that lives somewhere in an animal host in Central Africa. And I had started reading about Ebola in the late 90s, read some of the popular literature about Ebola and got very interested. And then in 1999, National Geographic asked me to do a series of articles about an American conservation biologist and explorer who was going to be doing a, an ambitious, crazily ambitious survey, hike, trek across the last remaining rich forest blocks, mostly un, unscathed by human presence, forest blocks in Central Africa. From the northeastern corner of the Republic of Congo, across that country, across Gabon to the Atlantic Ocean. Eventually 2,000 miles of walking through the forest, through, you know, wet forest, real, um, you know, tropical rainforest, Central African rainforest. Um, you know, people people in America tend to call it jungle, but jungle, of course, is a, 
is a, I, I believe it's a Hindi word that essentially refers to dry forest, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway, this is tropical. This is very wet tropical rainforest, swampy, um, richly diverse. And he was going to walk on this zigzag line through the, the center of the, the greatest remaining untouched forest blocks, mostly untouched. And National Geographic wanted me to write a series, a series of three stories about him. And uh, that meant making a series of, of shorter walks with him. 10 days here, two weeks there. So I would go in and out and connect with him and, and walk. And at one point we walked for two weeks through a forest block in Northeastern Gabon called the Minkebi forest block. And it was Ebola habitat. And we knew it was Ebola habitat. There had been human outbreaks on the edge of this forest block along one river, one, one that was famous from the, from the disease and medical literature that had occurred back in 1996, I believe it was. So we knew we were walking through Ebola habitat for two weeks and that the virus was living in some animal, some reservoir host, because every virus that suddenly appears in humans has to come from somewhere. It comes from another animal. Viruses can only replicate themselves in cellular creatures. A virus is not a cell, it's just a genetic parasite, of course. And so I had learned enough to know that there was such a thing as a reservoir host of Ebola. And it was some animal in that forest, but we didn't know what it was. It just knew that the virus was there. So it was a little spooky and we were very careful. Um, we were not living off wildlife. We were carrying our own food. Um, and we walked through this area and it was beautiful gorilla habitat, but it was completely empty of gorillas no sign of gorillas for two weeks and that was mysterious a mysterious absence and the reason probably is that gorillas are highly susceptible to ebola chimps also are highly susceptible to ebola just as humans are highly susceptible to ebola they can't be the reservoir host because they die from the virus when they get it and the gorilla population of that forest block seemed to have been killed off by ebola I got very interested in it at that point. And I realized that this mystery, where does this virus live? And when it gets into humans or gorillas, how does it spill over? That's the term when it passes from one host to another. How does it spill over from that reservoir host animal into humans? And I realized at that point, this is a, this is a question of ecology and evolutionary biology. And that's my beat. That's my comfort zone. So... I, at that point, got interested in writing a book about the ecology and evolutionary biology of scary viruses, emerging viruses, such as Ebola. And, and I did a, a piece on that subject for National Geographic in 2006 or 2007, and then I started working on the book and I worked on it for five years, and that was published in 2012. Wow. At any point during the time when you were in the rainforest, did you, like, you know, were you scared and did you fear for your life or anything like that? No, we were careful. We were, we were, we were judicious. This, this explorer scientist, his name is Mike Fay, wonderful, wonderful um, conservationist um, and intrepid explorer. Um, he made it clear to his forest crew. We had you know, we had 12 uh, African men working as forest crew, some of them as guides, some of them as, as camp assistants, carrying gear, uh, helping us set up camps, um, helping, you know, uh, cut a path through the forest, literally with a machete, because we weren't, most of the time we weren't even traveling on foot trails. There were no foot trails in most of these areas, except for, in some cases, elephant trails, a forest elephant. Um, and Mike made it very clear to his crew, look, we're not eating wildlife. We're carrying our food. If you see an animal dead, a monkey lying dead on the forest floor, do not pick it up and put it into the cook pot for tonight. Do not do that. So that was one of our great precautions. No, no dead monkeys were allowed to be served in the, in the, in the stew pot at the end of the day. Um, 
we we knew that the virus was there by the absence of um, of gorillas and by the history of outbreaks that had killed people on the river nearby. Uh, so we were cautious and curious and just carried on. Uh, and and that was generally my principle as I researched that whole book. In some cases, I was with scientists who were actively looking for the virus. So they were capturing animals, for instance, capturing bats and sampling them to look for a dangerous virus, to look for Ebola, or to look for one of these other dangerous viruses, such as Nipah virus in Malaysia and Bangladesh and in Eastern India, um, or Hendra virus in Australia. We were looking for the virus. So that was dangerous, but they took rational precautions. They wore personal protective gear. They wore Tyvek suits and two layers of gloves and, and gum boots and um, uh, goggles and masks. And so I wore whatever they wore and I stayed three feet behind them generally and watched their work carefully and tried to make sure that no one in the midst of this work would hand me either a bat with its claws and its teeth going in every direction or a needle. I, I let them do the work and I, I just held my notebook and scribbled, scribbled notes. That sounds crazy. <laughs> um, so in, in Spillover, you say that animal health and human health are tied together. So, you know, what do you mean by that? And, you know, what made you come to that conclusion? Well, this connectedness, um, I realized what scientists had realized, which is that um, the phenomenon of zoonotic diseases is a reminder of Darwin's great truth. And I think of it as one of the most important and dangerous of the truths that Darwin brought to the world in, in 1859 when he published On the Origin of Species. And that was that we humans are animals. We are animals. We are mammals. We are connected to other mammals on the family tree. And their viruses can become our viruses because of that similarity, because of that af af affinity, that connectedness. Um, and so um, the subject of animal health and human health are closely linked. And there is a, there is a term for that. There's a, a school of endeavor. It's almost a slogan, but it's called One Health, the One Health movement around the world. I'm going to a big international conference in Singapore next month, and it's the World One Health Congress. Um, and this way of seeing um, recognizes that animal health, human health, and ecosystem health are all connected, are all one health. And so if we abuse our ecosystems, and we abuse wild animals. Um, we there will be there will be health consequences for humans because that's where new viruses come from. They come from largely from human activities that bring us in close contact with wild animals, including the disruption of richly diverse ecosystems that contain so many species of wild animals, all of which are carrying their own unique viruses. Some of which are capable of spilling over into humans and infecting us. 60% of all infectious diseases actually come from animals. That's right. Yeah, so as like, when it comes to things like climate change and like you said, forest fragmentation, what are the implications of this for us, for the planet and yeah, for everyone, all, all species? Well, the implications are that we need to think about our footprints on the natural world. Each of us as individuals and collectively as a population of 8 billion large bodied, very hungry, very intelligent um, mammals. Um, and climate change, how is climate change connected to this? Uh, I think of I think of three big problems, the three huge problems that we have on this planet that are human caused problems. And those three huge problems are the loss of biological diversity, climate change, and infectious disease, the emergence of new diseases that can cause pandemics among humans. And those, uh, I think of those as three 
co-equal problems that are related to one another, but there's not one big problem that encompasses the other. I mean, we hear in this day and age, we, we hear a, a lot about climate change. We're not doing enough about climate change, but we hear about climate change to, to some extent to the eclipse of concern with the loss of biological diversity. And some people who are new to this whole subject think, oh, climate change is the ultimate problem. It's the big problem that encompasses everything else. Everything else is a subcategory of climate change. No, that's not right. Climate change is related to loss of biological diversity um, and to this problem of, of emerging diseases. Uh, in in roughly this way, the way I think of it is that these three big problems are like three huge brown roiling rivers that are rushing along parallel to one another. And there are some channels that interconnect them, but they are three mainly distinct rivers of trouble. But they all have the same origin. They are all coming from a snowfield, a vast snowfield on a mountain that is being melted. And the snowfield is running off into these three rivers of trouble. The, um, the snowfield is um, ecosystem integrity, ecosystem richness, biological diversity on the planet. And what's melting that is human impact, human population size multiplied by consumption. That's what's melting the snowfield and creating these three great rivers of trouble. So the lesson for us is that we need to think about everything that we do as individuals that contribute to our individual impact on the on the, the the natural ecosystems of the planet and the collective impact. So in particular, I I think it's important to think about the three things that represent the greatest footprint for each of us, and that is how many children you have if you choose to have children at all, uh, how much you travel, how much carbon you burn by flying around the world on airplanes or driving around in cars, but particularly flying in airplanes. And thirdly, how much meat you eat if you eat meat, because because raising meat for food is a is a high impact um, activity in terms of wild landscape um, and <laughs> excuse me and and carbon exchange. So those three things, uh, how many children we have, if we have children at all, uh, how, how much we travel by airplane and how much meat we meet, we eat. So, you know, I think more and more about those things. I don't have any children. Uh, I fly around on airplanes too much, or at least I did before the pandemic. Uh, and I still eat meat, not, you know, less and less all the time, but I'm not, a am not a vegan. So I need to, I need to look at myself in the mirror and, and ask myself, Every time I make one of those decisions, what is the impact? And it's what I encourage other people to do too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and in when you were doing research for spillover, you spoke to a lot of different scientists or people who are working on zoonotic diseases. So did did people say that there were there's probably going to be a pandemic or a global pandemic? Is that something that you found people predict were predicting or yes, they did. Yes, they were. Toward the end of that book, I describe having asked a number of these disease scientists, these these experts, um, will there be a next big one, a next big one, a next big pandemic? And if so, what is it likely to look like? And they told me, you know, 15 years ago, and I printed it in spillover 10 years ago, they essentially told me, yes, there will be a next big one. Um, it will be caused by a virus, probably almost certainly a single stranded RNA virus. That's a particular group of virus families that have RNA genomes as opposed to DNA genomes. And the significance of that is that RNA mutates more readily than DNA. DNA is a more, a more stable genetic molecule. And when it replicates itself, it has mechanisms for correcting mistakes. So its mutation rate is lower. RNA viruses, are much more changeable and therefore much more adaptable and much more evolvable and therefore much more likely to be able to pass from one kind of host into another. So back in 2012, I published what these scientists were saying, which is that watch out for a single stranded RNA virus coming out of a wild animal that might well be um, 
an influenza virus and it might well be a coronavirus. And that's what they were telling me. So this brings me to my next question. What's so special about viruses? Why is it that so many of infectious our infectious diseases are viral in nature? Well, over the history of human civilization, um, we've had infectious diseases of various sorts caused by bacteria, caused by protozoan, you know, malaria. There are a number of other very serious diseases that have been caught. Bubonic plague was caused by a bacterium. Um, uh, so it hasn't just been viruses, but um, the bacterial plagues, we've been able to control with the development of antibiotics. Antibiotics, which function very effectively against bacteria, or at least they did until we we used them so much that we started to get the problem of, of acquired antibiotic resistance among our bacterial pathogens. And that's that's a problem that's coming back. It's going to be a bigger problem in the future than it has been in recent past. Uh, but viruses are are unique. They are the non-cellular um, pathogens. They are just, um, I call them in, in the new book, Breathless, uh, um, I call them, each virus is a, a message in a bottle. Um, it's just a genome, either DNA or an RNA, wrapped in a protein capsule that is mechanistically capable of getting itself replicated by inserting its genome into living cells and and hijacking the machinery to make copies of itself. Um, I have a section in the new book, Breathless, about the, the question of the origin of viruses generally. Where do they come from? Where do they fit on the tree of life, if they even fit on the tree of life? And I had looked into that because National Geographic last year had asked me to write a story for them on that, on the, the origin of viruses. Are they even part of the tree of life? Where do they come from? And there are several different theories about how viruses originated. But one of the things you learn when you look at viruses is that they are not all bad. Um, one scientist, um, uh, the famous British scientist Peter Medawar, back in the 1960s or the 1970s, uh, rather um, hastily defined virus, a virus as um, bad news wrapped in a protein. The capsule is a protein capsule, bad news wrapped in a protein. But And Peter Medawar was a great scientist, but what he didn't realize then and what was learned by scientists after that was that sometimes the, it's good news wrapped in a protein. Viruses have played important roles in evolutionary history and sometimes for the benefit of this lineage or that lineage, including the mammal lineage. Um, they have contributed in unexpected ways, even by even by infecting us and inserting their genomes into our genome. Retroviruses are viruses, they're, they're retro because they sort of go backwards. They insert their genomes into the genomes of the cells that they infect. And so when those cells replicate themselves, they replicate the viral genome and that, that viral genome can be reactivated and then new virus particles come pouring out of that cell. That's what happens when HIV infects immune cells. But it's also possible for a retrovirus to infect reproductive cells in the mammal lineage or in the lineage of animals. This has happened over 100 million years. And when a retrovirus inserts itself into the genome of a reproductive cell, an egg cell, a sperm cell, or the stem cells that produce those cells, it becomes heritable. It gets passed along to offspring. That viral insertion, that viral DNA inserted into the genome. And we now know that 8% of the human genome is viral DNA that has been inserted over the history of the evolution of mammals into, oh, excuse me, of animals into mammals and mammals into primates. That lineage has acquired these sections of viral DNA by infection, some of which have been co-opted to serve new purposes, positive purposes in the mammal lineage, including one particular stretch of gene. It's known as sensitin 2 
that creates a membrane between the placenta and the fetus that's absolutely essential for successful human pregnancy. It's a viral gene. It used to be an, a, a gene that made an envelope pro, protein for a virus. Now, instead of making an envelope protein for a virus, it makes a membrane that allows the human female to transport nutrients across the boundary from the placenta to the fetus to nurture the fetus and allows the fetus to transfer waste products across the membrane um, back to the female so she can excrete them. A viral gene. I forget what your question was, but that's the answer. <laughs> I think that is crazy because we often think of evolution. If, if two things have the same kind of adaptation that they evolve them separately. But what you're saying means that viruses have the genes and they just gave them to us or like they can just transfer that's right. genes. And that's, just, that's crazy. That's right. And it's the process generally is called horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal, moving sideways from, in some cases, from one species to another, inserting new genes rather than vertical gene transport, which is essentially sexual reproduction and heredity. And that's what my 2018 book um, the Tangled Tree is about the subject of horizontal gene transfer. Very counterintuitive, but very important in the history of evolution. So you've studied both like the positive side of viruses and the negative side. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So coming back to the negative side. Um, so you said that a lot of the people you spoke to when you were doing research for spillover predicted the emergence of a pandemic and probably by a virus. So what are the conditions that cause a disease, a zoonotic disease to emerge? Is there a specific, like, are there specific conditions that need to be there? Well, or yes, there are. Um, first of all, um, a virus needs to be capable, needs either to be broadly adapted or capable of fast adaptation, potentially to a different host. Because being um, an infection, an, an infective virus inside a bat is for a virus living in a completely different ecosystem than the um, the ecosystem of the human body and the cells and the cell receptors in the human body. So a virus has to be capable of moving suddenly from one kind of ecosystem into a completely different kind of ecosystem and still managing to make a living and replicate itself. So either it has to be broadly adapted um, to several different kinds of ecosystem, and we can think of many many animals that are broadly adapted um, to different kinds of ecosystems, um, or it has to be capable of fast adaptation. And that means a high mutation rate uh, and um, another process that's helpful, and that's recombination. That's a process that um, in reference to viruses, it is the phenomenon of viruses, not just changing incrementally by point mutation. This letter of the genetic code, that letter of the genetic code, there are 30,000 letters in, of genetic code in the, in the coronavirus genome, for instance. So that's incremental. But there's also possible for, for blocks to change, for whole segments of genomes of different viruses to be swapped from one virus to another, um, section by section, um, like a whole paragraph, not just one letter is suddenly swapped into the genome of virus B because it's replicating in a cell at the same time as virus A. And the, the replication machinery essentially gets bumped from one viral genome to another and copies a section of the wrong viral genome into the product that it's producing. And then it might be bumped back and copy the rest of the original virus genome. And so suddenly there is a hybrid virus that maybe is 95% virus A and 5% virus B. That's recombination. That also helps um, coronaviruses among others um, to change quickly to make evolutionary leaps. You know, Darwin said, you know, evolution does not make leaps, uh, but he didn't know. He didn't know about these processes. He didn't have a, a real viable theory of genetics. He was a great, great thinker and he got many, many things right. It's amazing how many things he got right, but he didn't know about this. And it's, and it is, it, we now know that evolution can make 
um, quantum leaps, sudden changes. And one of those is by recombination of um, a, a couple of viruses. And so um, those are some of the conditions in the virus. But then in terms of circumstances, uh, this, this, what's required is, is close contact between humans and the animal reservoir that's carrying that broadly adapted or highly adaptable virus. So, um, you know, as, as our population of humans population has increased, there's been more and more contact uh, between humans and wild animals, disruptive contact, um, you know, living in, in richly diverse ecosystems, disturbing richly diverse ecosystems, cutting down trees, building timber camps, building mining camps, um, feeding off the wildlife that you find in the forest, in some cases, capturing wildlife and, and transporting them halfway around the world for food in some other culture. All of those things create great opportunities for viruses to spill from one kind of host into another. And viruses don't seek us out. They're not looking for humans to infect us. They only infect us when we offer them an opportunity to explore a new kind of habitat, a new ecosystem. So when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic, there's a lot of theories about how it emerged, like wet markets mm -hmm. in China and or perhaps artificially in a lab. Mm -hmm. So when you were writing your book about COVID and you were doing your research, what did you find? Well, I looked into all those um, theories um, and gave some attention, I hope fair attention to each of them. But what I found is that the, the evidence, the empirical evidence in support of natural spillover is much, 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 much stronger than the, the evidence, if any, or the, the narratives uh, that suggest the, the virus had nefarious origins of some sort, that either it was an engineered virus that was intentionally released to harm humans, no, or it was perhaps a, a wild virus, an animal virus that was manipulated in a laboratory for scientific purposes, maybe recklessly, and then it leaked from a laboratory, or that it was perhaps a, a wild virus that was taken into a laboratory and then simply leaked without ever having been manipulated. Those are the, the what I call the nefarious origins um, hypotheses. Um, and, and there are some writers, particularly popular writers, not so much um, scientists who have, who have spilled a lot of ink arguing for those. And magazine editors and newspaper editors um, embraced those, particularly early on in 2021. There was a little explosion of, of lab leak hypotheses articles. Some people said the lab leak hypothesis has now gotten more plausible. In my view, no, it never became more plausible. It just became more popular there was more attention to it. But in terms of po positive evidence, there still is virtually none. Um, there are the circumstances people say, well, this virus um, began in humans in the city of Wuhan and there is a Wuhan Institute of Virology and there's a woman who studies coronavirus is there. So it must have leaked from her lab. Well, I've talked to that woman. Her name is Zheng Li Shi. I talked with her by Zoom for two hours. We talked about what she was doing in her laboratory and what she wasn't doing. She was She makes her living studying coronaviruses and warning the world of the danger of some of these coronaviruses. And she she gets her professional reinforcement um, from publishing those discoveries. There is no evidence that this virus was ever, or a virus nearly identical to this virus was ever in her lab. And she swears that it was not in her lab. Um, people can say, well, she's lying, but you know, you then it becomes impossible to prove anything if you say, well, the scientists are lying. You need you need actual evidence. Otherwise, there's no end to that argument. So there's much more evidence that this, this outbreak began in or around that market, that wet market in the city of Wuhan that we've heard about, the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market. The earliest cases, the earliest 41 cases, are centered around that market. They're not centered around the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is nine miles away across the Yangtze River. There's no pattern. There's no geographical pattern around the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And there is a very strong geographical pattern around that market. Um, and there is evidence that there were animals on sale live, wild animals on sale in that market for food when this began. And there is evidence from sampling of that market after 
um, it was shut down, that um, that the part of that market in which wild animals susceptible to this virus were being sold was was a particular focus of of positive samples for the virus by scientists who came in later. There are these various different forms of evidence, um, as well as the history of, of zoonotic diseases and everything we know about them, um, that very strongly suggest that this... Oh, and there is also evidence that the virus spilled over into humans not once but twice separately in that market. There are two separate lineages. They call them lineage A and lineage B both traceable to that market, suggesting that there was perhaps not just one animal, but as you would expect, um, a number of animals, because these animals are kept cramped together, stacked on one another in cages, the, the wild animals that are sold live. So they're sharing their viruses. So it is, uh, uh, it is persuasive to hypothesize that, um, there were, there were more than one animal uh, infected with the precursor virus of this virus in that market, um, and that it spilled over probably twice to a human being in that market. Um, so we need to keep sampling. Um, unfortunately, that market was closed and cleaned, um, although there was sampling done later on, but it was, it was, it was emptied out and, and the vendors were all sent away and they took their animals away or they left behind frozen carcasses of some animals but the the, the wild li live animals were no longer there when the scientists arrived and so we lost a great opportunity to gather evidence about where the living precursor of this virus may have been and that and that's really um that's a tragedy we may not ever find the exact precursor of this virus but we need to keep looking for it in animals of central and southern china so i have two follow-up questions based on that mm -hmm. so the first is what do you think about wet markets based on this do you think that it's what people say that you know wet markets should be shut down i, I like what's your opinion on that and also uh what do you think about the global response to the pandemic and okay. you know how first, different countries first, responded first the question of wet markets the term is broad wet market um, wet markets sell fresh vegetables. That's where a lot of people get their fresh vegetables. It's at markets like the Huanan market. Uh, that's what, that's where they get their fresh seafood. Um, but if a wet market also contains, for instance, live birds, both wild birds caught for sale and poultry, that's very dangerous. And if it also includes live mammals, including wild mammals caught from the wild and sold for food, that's also very dangerous because of this possibility of sharing viruses from animal to, to animal and from animal to human. So live bird markets, for instance, this is a slightly more specific term, live bird markets, um, are known to be very dangerous um, because the influenzas come to us from birds. Most of these viruses that infect humans come from mammals, but the influenzas come from wild aquatic birds, sometimes directly from, um, from a wild bird into humans, sometimes from a wild bird into domestic poultry, chickens or ducks that might be kept in a family, a little family flock, and wild birds are flying in and, and, and dappling in the same rice paddy as, as the family flock of, of ducks passing the virus, and then it gets passed to the people also. Um, so so those, are, those are very dangerous situations, the live bird markets, and, and they probably need to be eliminated. And, and that's been said by a lot of people. And it, it's not just, you know, it's not just China. There are live bird markets all over the world. There are live bird markets in the U.S. There are live bird markets, I'm sure, in India. Uh, there are live bird markets in, in um, Cambodia and, and other places. Those are very dangerous situations and places where there is traffic in wild mammals um, and sale of them in markets. That's also very, very dangerous. Um, so we need to we need, need to either eliminate those situations or we need to actively monitor them very carefully and have scientists in there sampling those wild animals 
and the people who work with those wild animals so that we could detect new viruses in them before anybody even recognizes that he or she is sick. That's the, that's the active, proactive uh, surveillance. Uh, so what the other question was, oh, our human response to, to the pandemic. Well, um, the, the one thing that has surprised me more about this pandemic than anything else is not that it's a coronavirus, not that it probably came out of a wild animal, uh, but how poorly we responded to it, how unprepared we were to, to contain it, to limit the damage. Um, in 2003, the original SARS virus spilled over into humans in southern China. It got to Hong Kong and then from Hong Kong, it got by airplane to Toronto and Beijing and Bangkok uh, and a couple of other cities. And it quickly infected 8,000 people and killed 800, one in 10. So it was a really, really lethal virus, but it was not capable of asymptomatic transmission. People were sick and they looked sick and they acted sick before they were shedding this virus. So now we have this virus that is capable of spread from asymptomatic cases, making it much more dangerous. Um, and for that reason, among others, we weren't able to contain it the way SARS-1 was contained. But we should have been much more capable than we were in 2003 because we had had the example of SARS-1, the warning of SARS-1, the warning of years of of coronavirus research by people such as Zheng Li Shi in Wuhan, telling us that coronaviruses in certain animal hosts can be very dangerous, could spill over into humans, um, and there are these other dangerous viruses. So we should have been able to respond with, uh, we should have had proactive surveillance, we didn't. Um, we should have been able to contain the outbreak before it spread into an epidemic and a pandemic. Um, when I was researching spillover 15 years ago, scientists were telling me about developing real-time diagnostic testing for new viruses that would be ready as soon as a new virus was identified, its genome would go on a chip, there would be handheld units for diagnostic testing that could be used, for instance, at airport security checkpoints, so that you would, you would come to an airport security checkpoint and you would be swabbed as you stood in line and your swab would be put into one of these machines. And in the time it took you to take off your shoes and put them on the, on the conveyor belt and take your computer out of the case and put it in a, in a bin and, and your jacket and send those through the x-ray machine and then walk through the x-ray machine and come out the other side. In that amount of time, they would be able to tell whether you were carrying this new virus. And if you were carrying it, they would say, excuse me, Mr. Kwaman, you have to come aside, come over into this room. Um, put a mask on, we'll be wearing masks and we wanna interview you about this new virus. Um, didn't happen, didn't happen. I was surprised that that didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Not because we don't have the technology yet, but apparently because there had not been sufficient financial support for developing that technology. So for that reason, among others, we did poorly in response. We had bad national leadership in certain key countries we had terrible national leadership in mine, for instance, um, and uh, and that was that was very damaging. Donald Trump um, had no interest in this virus, except insofar as it affected his own popularity and the U.S. stock market. And mistakes were made because of that. He was saying early on, "This is going to disappear. It's not serious. It'll go away like magic." And I, I talk about this briefly in the book, although I mostly stay away from politics and it didn't go away like magic. Um, so there were there were tragic mistakes made and, and things that didn't happen that could have happened to contain this, to identify it, take it seriously early on and contain it. And we need to do much better the next time because there will be a next time. Yeah, and if I, if I rem remember correctly, I think one of his responses was to reduce funding to the World Health Organization or remove funding, which is just, I think, crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so we have a lot of questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm just going to go to some of those questions now. Okay. Um, so someone is asking, in Breathless, do you write about um, patient zero? Did you ever get close to knowing patient zero for COVID? No, nobody knows who patient zero is for this. 
Uh, it would be nice if we did know, but it's it's frequently hard to know who patient zero is. Patient zero itself is a concept that arose in some of the popular literature about AIDS early on. Um, and, um, and we don't know who patient zero was for AIDS either. Um, we might have a strong hypothesis as to who patient zero was for the 2013 to 2016 epidemic of Ebola in West Africa, three West African countries, but we don't know for sure even then. Um, in this case, uh, we don't know someone, perhaps um, a, a vendor or a delivery person in the Wanan seafood wholesale market, uh, but we don't know. And it's going to be very difficult for us ever to find out because um, because evidence has been lost or evidence that could have been gathered was not gathered. Um, and so someone is asking, in your book, Spillover, you tried to connect many zoonotic diseases with the illegal wildlife trade, um, but still after COVID-19, there are cases of people going for exotic species all over the world. So what is your opinion or insight on this? Well, we need to deal with that. That is, I, I agree that that is a, a remaining very important problem. Um, countries need to have laws and regulations um, to constrain that trade, that illegal wildlife trade. There are laws and regulations. They need to be better enforced. For instance, um, there is continuing a massive trade in pangolins, those wonderful creatures that look like anteaters uh, covered with protective scales like armadillos, but they're not actually armadillos and they're not actually anteaters. They're just, they have um, come to resemble them by convergent evolution. They're a separate group of mammals, four species in um, Africa and four species in uh, India, Southeast Asia and China. Um, and they are heavily trafficked for food because they're perceived as a luxury food item. And they're also trafficked for their scales, which are perceived to have medicinal qualities, although their scales consist of nothing but keratin, like our fingernails. Um, and uh, the trade in pangolins is, um, is illegal um, in, in, the, in, the, in the countries where it's native and um, by international um, treaty, the CITES. Um, the uh, Conference on International Trade in Endangered Species. Uh, uh, so it shouldn't be happening, but it is still happening. There's a black market in pangolins. And pangolins carry coronaviruses. Pangolins have a role. I write about them in Breathless. Um, they carry coronaviruses, some of which have high similarities to this virus, and they may have been uh, involved somehow in the recombination of viruses that yielded this virus. We don't know that for sure. Uh, but that the, the laws against such trade need to be better enforced, need to be expanded. Um, we need to get a handle on that. It's, it's absolutely essential and it shouldn't be continuing, but it is because there's always a black market. There's always demand for that. We need to educate people to get them past that demand. Uh, and there's a lot of questions popping up about science communication. So mm -hmm. one question is, I'm currently reading your book on Darwin, and I think it's such a different piece from your other books. The depth of the research is staggering. As a science communicator, communicator, often I get stuck with the research and lose the focus of the story. What is your writing process when you're reading research and translating that into a compelling story? Well, when I do research, I, I read, 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 read. I read the, the history of science. I read the science books on this subject. I read, as I mentioned, a lot of journal papers. Uh, and I talked to a lot of scientists. My little biography of Darwin is different from other work that I've done um, because it's a, it's a, a pure biography. It's a, it's a radically concise biography. It's, a, a, it's a, again, on something a lot of other people have written about. There've been many, many biographies of Darwin, but I was asked by an editor friend who was, who was, um, organizing a series of radically concise, literarily pleasing biographies of famous 
characters, in particular scientific characters. And he asked me to do Charles Darwin. And I was flattered. And I thought, Darwin, uh, how, how can I write a biography of Darwin? There have been some great, huge biographies of Darwin. And uh, he said, his name was Jim Atlas. He said, well, those are not your comp competition. Those are your resources. I want essentially a 200 page essay on the life of Charles Darwin. You can make it a little bit personal. You can use a literary voice. Um, you can organize it however you want. So I decided to to do this biography of Darwin. I had read the big biographies and admired them very much because I was very interested in Darwin. Janet Brown's two volume biography of Darwin in particular. And so I reread those and I decided that I would write this biography by um, by trying to stay very close to Darwin as a person by reading his his early journals on the subject of evolution um, before he even had a theory of evolution when he was just a young man back from the voyage of the beagle he started keeping notebooks brainstorming about um, what he thought might be a process of transmutation of one species into another one form of life into another he suspected that this may have occurred but he didn't have a theory for it so i read his transmutation notebooks and I, I bought a multi-volume set of his collected correspondence from Cambridge University Press. I paid five hundred dollars for you know ten volumes of Darwin's edited correspondence. So I focused mo mostly on those, and I wanted his real words as written at the time to himself, very privately in these notebooks, and his real words written to his friends and other um, uh, correspondents in his letters. And so I told the story by focusing on just a few, like five or six relatively short periods, critical periods in Darwin's life and, and telling the story by trying to stay close to him as a person, thinking of him as a real living guy. What was it like for him at the time? He didn't know he was going to be famous. He was just working on this crazy theory. What was it like for him as a, as a person at the time? and doing that through his own words as much as possible. I'm very glad uh, um, that the person who asked the question is enjoying that book. Okay, uh, another question is, which I think is a really interesting question. Has your work ever influenced scientific discussion amongst the experts beyond translating complicated concepts to the general public? So for example, did Song of the Dodo have any interesting impacts on island biogeography? And this person also adds that I'm a big fan and thank you for inspiring my career. Well, thank you. Um, I th think I, I'm not going to claim that um, my books on these scientific subjects influence um, mid-career scientists in the way they do their science. Although I have been very, um, very well supported and welcomed by most of the scientists in the fields that I write about, not because I've taught them anything, but because I that they feel I have helped them explain things to the general public. And sometimes they feel that's part of their job, but they, they like the way I have explained things, explained their work among others to the general public. And that helps them. I think the only way that in a sense, I have been like one of those retroviruses inserting my ideas into the genome of scientists is by um, inspiring young people. And I have heard over the years from a number of young people who have said, oh, I read the Song of the Dodo when I was an undergraduate and it influenced me to become an ecologist. Or I read your Darwin biography and it influenced me to become an evolutionary biologist. Or I read your book Spillover when I took my first disease course as an undergraduate and it influenced because it was a, a sign book in that course and it I became fascinated with infectious diseases and the ecology and evolutionary uh, aspects. And so I went into to disease scientists. And now I'm, a, I'm a, a veterinarian with a master's in public health, and I work for an agency that works on infectious diseases. So I have, I have had that sort of um, reinforcement, and, and it's, all th it's always thrilling to me to hear that from a person. I mean, I can also add to that that I read Song of the Dodo when I was doing my undergrad. <laughs> definitely influenced my career choices. Oh, thank um, you, Vinny. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, questions coming in also about conservation and penetration of information to like other sections of society. Mm -hmm. So someone says that 
um, penetration of critical information pertaining to welfare, health, safety of the most vulnerable people is essential for their for them to be safeguarded, and yet they're the ones who are least informed. So um, how is it possible for science communicators to displace ignorance and drive information-based decisions or human behavior? And how can we also penetrate, you know, the people that are least informed? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a hard, good question. Um, for instance, the indigenous people that I write about in uh, Monster of God, those people like the Maldari people in Gear and um, the, the, sh the sheep herders in Romania who, who run their sheep through the mountains uh, in the presence of wolves and, and brown bears and have very strong opinions about the bear because it's a threat to their, to their livelihood. And yet some of them have great respect for the brown bear and love the brown bear. I talked to a few like that. Um, or um, the Aboriginal people in Australia who live in the habitat of the saltwater crocodile and have um, thousands of years history of um, living among these dangerous animals and, and harvesting them to some extent for food. Um, how do you reach them and change their attitudes? Well, I don't presume to be capable of changing their attitudes about these very real problems that they deal with, the, the difficult aspects of big predators, because big predators are inconvenient for people living rural lives on the, on the landscape. There's no doubt about that. Um, I don't presume to be capable of, of changing their views, but I have a great hope that their children will have opportunities to be educated. Maybe their, their children will get to go to a village school and stay in school through, through primary school rather than, you know, particularly with the young girls, there's always pressure for them to get married too soon and, and for their education to be interrupted. Nothing is more important than finding ways um, to, to protect the, the opportunities of education of young people, especially girls, uh, so that they can continue to get educated and come out of that primary school and then maybe have an opportunity to go to a, go to a town and go to a secondary school and then maybe have an opportunity to go to the city and go to a university. And if I'm able to be part of their education somewhere along that way, that helps them understand the situation of their family and their tribal group or their ethnic group their indigenous group, where they came from, so that they can perhaps become conservation biologists who maybe go back and work on solutions that are respectful of the indigenous people, but also effective in protecting the biological diversity. I will die a happy man if I have some little role in that. And that's what I think we can we can hope to do is make sure that the children of indigenous people get the opportunity for education uh, and the opportunity to view the complexities of those situations, the dilemmas, the conundrums of those situations, people and predators trying to live together, people and biological diversity trying to coexist. If we can help children get better educated about those complexities, it's never all black and white, then um, that's, I think, the most important promising thing that we can do. Uh, I think that's a very inspiring message, and especially for people in my office, because we have a whole branch of people working on children's education in rural areas and high conflict areas. That's, there, there it is, there it is, nothing more important than that. Okay, so with one final question, we'll wrap everything up. And um, so someone is asking, do you have any advice for aspiring writers and for aspiring researchers? And also, do you have any advice for journalists who are trying to break into, you know, that career and, you know, any advice for how they can pitch stories? Well, I can't give specific advice on that. Uh, everybody who is a writer has to teach himself or herself how to be a writer. I don't really think you can teach someone else to be a writer. The best thing you can do if you want to learn to be a writer is read, 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 read. Read great writing, read great journalism if you want to be a journalist, read great nonfiction uh, about science if you want to be a science writer, a science author, and then and then reread it 
find find great books or or really interesting books by <laughs> by uh, major writers and then and then read them all and then reread them the first time you read a book you find out what the author is telling you uh, and the second time you read it you start to see how the author is doing it so you don't really understand a book until you've read it twice i think in terms of how it works so that's the way you teach yourself the only uh, other advice i i would give i guess is um, don't do it unless you really have to do it um, writing is not a good way to make a living it's not an answer to the question of how how can i pay the rent um, it's uh, it takes a long time to make it work and unless you really feel like i have to do this i just won't feel complete unless i try to do this I have to do this, then uh, unless you feel that way, you won't you won't have the patience and you won't have the persistence um, probably to succeed because it takes a long time and it takes a lot of stubbornness and patient patience and discipline. I think of I think of the three th you know, crucial things to becoming a professional writer as being talent, discipline and luck. You have to have some talent for putting words together, for telling stories. If you're a science writer, telling stories of people doing science, you have to have some talent. You can develop that talent with discipline. You have to have a lot of discipline. And then you also have to have luck. You have to you have to stumble across some opportunities and 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 have some some mentorship and some some people who open a door for you here and there. But of those three entities, I would say the most important are the first two talent and discipline. And if you have some talent and you have enough, enough discipline and you persist long enough, eventually probably you'll get a little bit of luck. Amazing. So I wish you, if, I wish you that luck. If I wish you that talent and that, I can't wish you that talent, but if you have that talent, I, I wish you the discipline to, to, um, to give it a chance. And I, and I wish you the luck you, the, the, to the inspiring writers, aspiring writers out there. Amazing, thank you for that. Um, so if, if there's anyone in our audience who, you know, their question didn't get asked, uh, please feel free to email us at outreach at cwsindia.org and maybe we can forward your questions to David and, you know, have them answered. Yes, um, yeah. But unfortunately, yeah, but unfortunately I think we're out of time right now. Um, I know that I have a lot more questions, but, um, and I'm sad to see this end, but thank you so much, David, this was so great. You're very welcome. Well. Thank you for yeah. the hospitality. Thanks for the the audience and the good questions. Um, thanks to CWS. Um, I can't wait to get back to India. I love India. I have a lot of good friends there. Um, so I, and I don't know when I will next get back as I cut down on the airplane travel that I do. Um, but I will s certainly look forward to that day. Yeah. So hopefully see you soon in, in Bangalore or maybe in India. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Okay. Thanks for Thank your you. Enjoy Thank you talking. so much.